Welcome to the fourth quarter 2019 Arista Networks Financial Results Earnings Conference Call. During the call, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be provided at that time. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press the star followed by zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded and will be available for replay from the Investor Relations section at the Arista website following this call. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Curtis McKee, Director of Corporate and Investor Development. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. With me on today's call are Jay Shree Ulal, Arista Network's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Edith Brennan, Arista's Chief Financial Officer. This afternoon, Arista Networks issued a press release announcing the results for its fiscal fourth quarter ending September 31, 2019. If you would like a copy of this release, you can access it online on the company's website. During the course of this conference call, Arista Networks Management will make forward-looking statements, including those relating to our financial outlook for the first quarter of the 2020 fiscal year. Longer-term financial outlooks, industry innovation, our market opportunity, the benefits of recent acquisitions and the impact of litigation, which are subject to the risks and uncertainties that we discuss in detail in our documents filed with the SEC, specifically in our most recent Form 10-Q and Form 10-K, and which could cause actual results to differ materially from those anticipated by these statements. These forward-looking statements apply as of today, and you should not rely on them as representing our views in the future. We undertake no obligation to update these statements after this call. Also, please note that certain financial measures we use on this call are expressed on a non-GAAP basis and have been adjusted to exclude certain charges. We have provided reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures in our earnings press release. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jay Shree. Thank you, Curtis, and welcome to your first Arista earnings call. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for our fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. We delivered a non-GAAP revenue of $552.5 million, with a non-GAAP earnings per share of $2.29. Services contributed approximately 19% of the revenue, consistent with the typically higher renewals at the year end. Our non-GAAP gross margins were 65.2%, influenced by a strong performance of the enterprise vertical and associated software-attached products. Overall, our 2019 gross margin came in at 64.7%. We registered a record number of million-dollar customers in Q4 as a direct result of our enterprise momentum. By the end of 2019, we have acquired over 6,300 customers cumulatively, with Microsoft at 23% of total revenue and Facebook at 16.6%. In Q4 2019, and actually much throughout the year, Cloud Titans was the largest vertical. The enterprise segment is now consistently the second largest and strongest segment, followed by the financials in third place, tier two cloud specialty providers in fourth, and service providers in fifth place. Both service providers and tier two cloud providers have been slow for us. Arista, as you know, in terms of geography, 2019 international contribution was 24%, with the Americas at 76%. In terms of new products in 2019, Arista, as you know, delivered a banner year of disruptive products redefining networking with a highly differentiated software stack, management, and flagship platforms. The 7280 and 7500 series especially have become the gold standard in 100 gigabit spine networking. We also introduced substantial 400 gigabit innovations with 10 new platforms. We launched a new portfolio of cognitive campus edge products for wired, power over ethernet switches, and wireless, including Wi-Fi 6. Our inherent software flexibility brings federated management and control planes across multiple merchant silicon data planes, and this is one of our key differentiators. We continued our systematic innovations in cloud EOS, and Cloud Vision features. In particular, we have doubled our Cloud Vision customers delivering real-time streaming, telemetry, availability, scale, automation with change control, as well as third-party interoperability. We are pleased with the increased acceptance of total software bookings, both in subscription and perpetual licenses, 
now approaching 5% of total revenue annually. We began Q1 2020 with the close of our third acquisition, Big Switch Networks, and FC Info. This is a strategic combination of engineering expertise, deeper entry into the network packet broker market, and increased software multi-cloud visibility. As you know, we've always been focused on software-driven networking as a mission in Avista. With Big Switch, we have analytics strength, complementing our switch-based DANs or data analyzer platforms with Big Switch's deeper monitoring fabric across public, private, and hybrid clouds. Both companies also share a unique visionary status with data center networking in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. We welcome the BCN team, BSN team, into Arista family and really look forward to a strengthened partnership, not only with them, but with Dell Technologies, as well as the approximately 300 customers we're getting to know better. While the Big Switch acquisition is not material, we do expect this to contribute to our software strengths and bookings. And our goal is to become a creative. As we wrap that Arista is in the clear forefront of making cloud area networking more and more. See that networking and the future of it is not, not silos or boxes with multiple operating systems and spaghetti OSs, but a new uniform software-driven place in the cloud architecture. We are proud of our market leadership with the number one spot in 100 gigabit Ethernet switching and ready for 400 gigabit migration ahead of us. We are experiencing trials that are going well with several customers. We are poised to achieve our first 100 million target for the first four quarters of campus revenue as well. Our go-to-market strength continues to be an important investment area for us as we have doubled the sales and systems engineering capacity over the past two years. With the promotion of Chris Schmidt to Senior Vice President of Worldwide Sales and Ashwin Kohli to Senior Vice President of Customer Engineering, reporting to Anshu Sadana, their transition to their new roles has been seamless following the departure of Manny Ravello to a PE firm in conjunction with his executive advisory role to us. Both Krish and Ashwin have long tenure with us and epitomized the Arista ways. As I've traveled the world, including hundreds of customers we touch, it is clear to me that we're winning strategic enterprise franchises across high-tech, media, banking, healthcare, insurance, and retail sectors, to name a few. Large enterprises are increasingly frustrated and anxiously seeking better bridge to cloud-based principles. Our program programmability with software and quality with the lowest critical vulnerabilities in the networking industry is a refreshing and welcome change to them. Arista is gaining strategic relevance, almost doubling our million-dollar customers within the past three years. I expect this momentum to, momentum to continue and uh, happen across all the non-cloud verticals. With that, I'll turn it over to Ida for more financial specifics. Thanks, Jayshree, and good afternoon. This analysis of our Q4 and full year 2019 results and our guidance for Q1 2020 is based on non-GAAP and excludes all non-cash stock-based compensation impacts, certain acquisition-related charges, and other non-recurring items. A full reconciliation of our expected GAAP to non-GAAP results is provided in our earnings release. Total revenues in Q4 were $552.5 million, down 7% year-over-year and above the midpoint of our guidance of $540 to $560 million. Service revenues represented approximately 19% of total revenue, up from 15.2% last quarter, reflecting typical fourth quarter service renewal seasonality in conjunction with a lower product revenue number. International revenues for the quarter came in at $137.7 million, or 25% of total revenue, up from 19% in the third quarter. Looking to the year, international revenues accounted for 24% of total revenue, down from 28% in the prior year. This shift in geographical mix for the year was largely driven by heavier U.S. deployments by our Cloud Titan customers. Overall gross margin in Q4 was 65.2%, above the upper end of our guidance range of 63 to 65% and up from 64.4% last quarter. This reflected a lighter Cloud Titan contribution in the period, combined with good performance from our enterprise and financial verticals. Operating expenses for the quarter were $154.3 million, or 27.9% of revenue, down from last quarter at $163 million. 
R&D spending came in at 96.2 million, or 17.4% of revenue, down from 105.3 million last quarter. This decline largely reflected lower engineering and prototype costs in the period. Sales and marketing expense was 46.4 million, or 8.4% of revenue, with increased headcount, somewhat offset by reductions in other sales costs. Our G&A costs were consistent with last quarter at approximately 12 million, or 2.1% of revenue. Our operating income for the quarter was 205.8 million, or 37.3% of revenue. Other income and expense for the quarter was a favorable 11.2 million, and our effective tax rate was approximately 15.5%. This lower tax rate reflected the release of some uncertain tax position related reserves following final agreement with the relevant tax authorities. Please note, however, that we do expect to see some upward pressure on the effective tax rate over time as various tax jurisdictions continue to modify their tax rules. This resulted in net income for the quarter of 183.4 million, or 33.2% of revenue. Our diluted share number for the quarter was 80.26 million shares, resulting in a diluted earnings per share number for the quarter of $2.29, of 1.8% from the prior year. Now turning to the balance sheet. Cash, cash equivalents and investments entered the quarter at approximately $2.7 billion. We repurchased $51.5 million of our common stock during the quarter at a weighted average price of $189 per share. This brings our total repurchases for the year to $266 million over three quarters. As a reminder, our Board of Directors has authorized a three-year, $1 billion stock repurchase program commencing in Q2-19. The program allows us to repurchase shares of our common stock opportunistically and is funded from operating cash flows. We generated $327 million of cash from operations in the fourth quarter, reflecting strong net income performance and a decrease in working capital requirements of approximately $115.4 million. DSOs came in at 65 days, up from 63 days in Q3, reflecting the timing of billings in the period. Inventory turns were 2.9 times, down from 3.1 last quarter. Inventory increased to $244 million in the quarter, up from $240 million in the prior period. Our total deferred revenue balance was $575 million, up from $529 million in Q3. As a reminder, our deferred revenue balance is now almost exclusively services related, with any significant product deferred revenue amounts having been recognized to the income statement in the first half of the year. As Jay Shree mentioned, we have two greater than 10% customers of the year, Microsoft at 23% and Facebook at 16.6%. If you exclude the recognition of product deferred revenue referenced above, Facebook would have represented approximately 12% of revenue for the year. Accounts payable days were 44 days, up from 31 days in Q3, reflecting the timing of inventory receipts and payments. Capital expenditures for the quarter were $2.4 million. Now turning to our outlook for the first quarter and beyond. While we're not in a position at this point to provide full year guidance, we wanted to reiterate the various puts and takes discussed on our last call. 2019 has been a challenging year for our cloud business with significant volatility and an overall muted demand picture. As we look forward to 2020, we believe this, re- this trend continues with demand from this part of the business being flat to down on a year-over-year basis. This trend combined with tough year-over-year revenue comparisons due to the recognition of $118 million of product deferred revenue in the first half of 2019, will likely result in a meaningful decline in cloud revenue for 2020. Enterprise and financials are expected to grow healthily, but are not yet large enough to fully offset the expected revenue decline from cloud. Service provider and specialty cloud will likely remain sluggish for the year. On the gross margin front, we would reiterate our overall gross margin outlook of 63 to 65%, with customer mix being the key driver. Focusing specifically on Q1, we expect to trend lower in this range, given a lighter revenue number and a typical first quarter weighting towards cloud. We'll continue to manage investments in the business carefully with targeted growth in sales and R&D headcount, balancing the need to expand our market coverage with prudent financial management. We announced the acquisition of Big Switch Networks earlier today. This represents an immaterial transaction which brings us some additional software capabilities and a strong engineering talent pool. From a financials perspective, this is a software subscription business with upfront license revenue recognition and a fair amount of services deferred revenue. We're beginning the business and accounting integration now 
and the acquisition would be recorded in our financials for the first quarter. We have included a small revenue contribution and two months of expenses for Big Switch in our guidance for the first quarter. We will provide additional clarity on the go-forward income statement impacts once we've completed the purchase accounting analysis. Finally, our guidance for Q1 does not reflect any impact from the ongoing coronavirus outbreak in China. While we do not have a significant direct manufacturing footprint in China, there may be some indirect supply chain impacts. We will look to monitor and attempt to mitigate these as the situation unfolds. With all of this as a backdrop, our guidance for the first quarter, which is based on non-GAAP results and excludes any non-cash stock-based compensation impacts and other non-recurring items, is as follows. Revenues of approximately 522 to 532 million, gross margin of approximately 63%, operating margins of approximately 34%. Our effective tax rate is, to be, is expected to be approximately 21%, with diluted shares of approximately 80.5 million shares. I will now turn the call back to Curtis. Curtis? Thank you, Ida. We are now going to move to the Q&A portion of the Arista Earnings Call. Due to time constraints, I'd like to request that everyone please limit themselves to a single question. Thank you for your understanding. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the Arista Earnings Call. In order to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. We ask that you pick up your handset before asking questions in order to ensure optimal sound quality. Your first question comes from Pierre Faragou with New Street Research. Your line is open. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for taking my question. Um, I was wondering on uh, like the, the outlook you gave for your cloud Titan clients. Uh, so we understand like uh, flat to slightly down uh, year on year, which means that we'll have a bit of a recovery during the year. And I think it's uh, it's surprising that it contrasts it's uh, contrast, con- contrasting a lot with what we've heard from other suppliers uh, on the compute side. On the memory side, we've heard much, uh, we've seen much better numbers in the second half of last year, uh, and much more positive comments about the first half of this year. So, so you don't seem to be on a similar cycle. Things seems to be coming back slower for you guys. And so, a- any way you could help us understand that would be very helpful. Yeah, sure, Pierre. I will take part of the question, and Anshu can elaborate. Um, the cloud capex spending has never correlated one to one with Arista's uh, network um, uh, numbers, and and the reason is many because as you know it's a very small part of their total capex. It's almost negligible the network piece, and often they make the compute and the storage decisions first, and the network comes later. So there's a lag. Um, so you know our visibility right now, as I've often told you, is one to two quarters. And we can't say much about the whole year, let alone, um, you know, Q2 or second half. So uh, while we are making predictions based on our 2019, both the absorption of deferred revenue and the, and the current uh, understanding of their uh, plans, things might change. Um, we're reflecting what we know best as of now, especially when you look at our year-over-year comps for 2018 and 19. Anshu says I did good enough, so he has nothing more to add. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Jeshree. You, Thank you. Your next question comes from Nita Marshall with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. I just wanted to know if you could kind of give a little bit of an update on the campus business traction and just whether you had seen any kind of pause in purchasing activity due to macro. Thanks. Well, um, uh, thank you, Meta, and thank you. I think it's the first call for you with Arista, so welcome. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you know, as you know, our campus business is in its very early stages. We only started shipping in Q3 2019. We've had two full quarters now of campus. And uh, I'm very encouraged by the enthusiastic response from both our existing customers as well as new customer acquisition. Um, as I look at our uh, million-dollar customers that I was talking about uh, um, and the record number we have achieved, many of them have also been campus. Um, and so we, uh, I see that, uh, at least from our little oasis or island, uh, we're not really a macro bellwether. We're more of a technology bellwether. And uh, the technology in both on our POE and Wi-Fi has been very well accepted along with our splines and cloud vision. and. Q4 was a very good indication of that. 
Great, thanks. Your next question comes from Eric Suffiger with JMP Securities. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. Um, one, what, what what are the priorities in terms of your integration with Big Switch? What are what are you going to be? Uh, which which products are you going to be focusing on? Then, secondly, uh, is there anything that we should be concerned about with China? Did you see any evidence of, um, of impact from the, the virus issues going on there? Uh, so I'll take the first question, and also maybe you, uh, you know, with your COO title, you, you know more about what's sure. going on there. Um, so on the what's the priorities for the big switch? Um, well, as I said, first of all, we were incredibly impressed by the engineering team. So we have uh, selected the best of the best, and they're very much part of uh, the, the acquisition has closed. And I want to give a big shout-out to Mark Taxi and Ida for the hard work that went into that. It's a 10-year-old company. There's a lot of detail. Um, so uh, the at the end of the close of the acquisition, we have absorbed approximately 75 employees, uh, um, a large percentage of them in engineering. And uh, there are two product lines uh, that Big Switch carries, the BMF, which is the monitoring product, which, is, which is a, as I explained, is a perfect complement to DANS. DANS is Arista's inline integrated switching product, and BMF is just icing on the cake. It has deeper visibility, service nodes, recorder nodes, a monitoring fabric, et cetera. And then DCF, which is meant for more of a converged fabric, and um, and uh, we fully expect that to be a very important piece, especially with our converged infrastructure partners like Dell Technologies. So both products will be fully supported and carried through, but with different channels. Great. Great. So your question on uh, China and supply chain with respect to coronavirus, um, as Ida mentioned, we don't do any direct manufacturing in China. So it really comes down to secondly the effects of our manufacturers, suppliers, or their sub suppliers and the raw material coming from China. So far, we haven't seen any big impact because it's just been a few weeks after the, uh, really a few days after the end of the Chinese New Year. And our uh, manufacturers are saying they're they okay for the short term. However, if the situation continues for a long period and uh, there's very little supply available of raw material uh, and over an extended time, then it can have impact in the future. But it's too early to say anything right now and we expect more answers uh, from the Chinese suppliers of the factories uh, through the rest of the month and even in March. Uh, so again, too early, but uh, for now we're okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ancho. Your next question comes from Rod Hall with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, guys. Thanks for the question. Um, and girls, I wanted to um, – I guess I wanted to – or girls and guys is probably the right order for that, actually – I wanted to ask a couple of vertical questions. Um, so, Ida, you had commented that cloud, you expect a meaningful decline, and I don't know if um, if you could give us any more feeling for what you mean by that. We were thinking a you know, kind of low double digits sort of decline this year, but I don't know if that sounds like more than that. And then the other, on the positive side of this equation, the service provider commentary, you said sluggish. Um, we were thinking that would be declining this year, but it almost – I just want to clarify, do you think that that – are you expecting a little bit of growth there or stabilization there, kind of flattish revenue there? Um, and then a bigger picture question, Jay Shree, is have you guys considered disclosing these verticals or some subset of them? Is that something we could maybe look forward to at some point in the future, at least on an annual basis, so we can, you know, all track kind of what's happening under the covers in the verticals? Okay, Rod, I'll, I'll try and answer all, as many of your questions. The last one first. Um, so the answer is we try to do our best by ranking ranking them, and I, I guess you're looking for more granularity, so we'll definitely take it under advisement like we do anything you suggest, and uh, maybe that's a data point for Analyst Day. Okay. And going back to your cloud decline and service provider, um, Flat to down, I think, definitely means flat to double-digit down. We don't exactly know how much now because we're in the first quarter. I think uh, Anshul and the team will get much more visibility in maybe analyst day or second half because that's when we really get a good sense. But Q1 is such a seasonal quarter, we don't have enough data. It's more an extension of Q4. Um, so ask us this question again in May or June, and I think we'd have a lot more to say. Service providers? Um, yeah, I think when when uh, Ida actually explained the definition of sluggish to me, which is it's not that bad, and I think the worst was last year. 
So it, it's bottomed out and it can only get slightly better is our feeling. But we're not like holding our breath or anything, but it, we, we believe it can't get worse. But sluggish, would it be some range around zero, uh, then, Jay Shree, not <laughs> like zero, the zero plus or minus, zero. yeah. Negative number? Not minus, not minus. Not declining further, yeah. that, I think, is Above our, zero. Our, our, our hope, right? I mean, it did decline a fair amount in 2019, and we'd like to think that, you know, it starts to recover a little bit from there, but sluggish kind of implies slowly. <laughs> um, okay, but that's better than I thought, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Your next question comes from John Marchetti with Steve. Your line is open. Thanks very much. Just, Jay Shree, I just, you know, as we're getting closer to this, you know, reaching the end of this sort of first hundred million on the campus side, and you've added a couple of pieces there. I'm just curious as we look out uh, the, the next couple of years, uh, you know, how maybe we should think about that business trending, you know, up towards a, a little bit more of a meaningful contribution to the overall growth rate. And then, Edith, just real quick on the tax rate, I just wanted to make sure that I heard it correctly, that at least starting uh, in, in 20, we should expect this lower rate to continue and that it may tick back up over time, but that we're at least, you know, expecting that, that lower tax rate to continue uh, over the near term. Thanks. Yeah, let me take the tax one first, maybe. Um, so the Q4 tax rate at the 15%, I mean, that's the once-off, right? It's, it's a, some very specific uh, reserves that were released in the period. Uh, you know, as we go forward, we've been thinking about the structural tax rate somewhere around 21%. Uh, that's what we guided for Q1. Um, you know, there's probably more upward pressure than downward pressure on that over time. Um, so I think, you know, 21, 21 and a half, it's in that range somewhere. But I think for now, you're in the 21% range for Q1. And then maybe you see a couple of basis, you know, tens of basis points kind of increase over time. But it's, uh, uh, it'll take time. So that was more kind of a longer term structural rate statement, uh, the 21% plus or minus hasn't really changed in, in the current time frame. Okay. And, uh, John, to take your question on the campus, um, we think, you know, being a new kid in the block, uh, when there's been a fairly mature market and a $10 billion TAM, largely, largely Cisco and maybe um, HP Aruba, um, just for us to enter in and be taken seriously is the first order of business. And I have to say, uh, the enthusiasm um, – for Arista, the software, the cognitive cloud vision has been very well received. So I think delivering the first four quarters of 100 million will really establish a baseline for more growth. As I said at the last analyst meeting, I'd be very disappointed if we didn't have that more growth translate into, you know, doubling and doubling again. So I'm, 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 my team would be looking to take that 100 million to 200 million and then to 400 million and then some. But more on analyst today, maybe, on exactly how we do that in the details. Great. And callers, as a reminder, please keep uh, one question per call and come forward. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from Jason Adder with William Blair. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, JHP, you guys have prided yourself from day one on a single OS. Um, now with Big Switch, you're going to have a second OS. So I'm just wondering how we should be thinking about uh, the future of Big Switch's OS. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Uh, we've actually done three acquisitions and had to deal with the OS t twice before. So to an before I answer your Big Switch question, let's take the other two. Metamarco, very F FPGA-centric. It was really for the high-frequency trading market, low latency. You know, the OS did not play a big role, and when it does, it will be EOS, right? Uh, Mojo, really a radio management Wi-Fi. We immediately integrated into Cloud Vision, and, the, again, the OS was less important than the Cloud Vision integration to bring wired and wireless together. Big Switch, we fully expect that same Cloud Vision integration with DAMS and um, uh, DA, uh, BMS, the monitoring fabric. Um, so the OS will be somewhat transparent, and the unification of inline DANs and a monitoring fabric will be much more important. The big cloud fabric is, is the uh, unique product, and we believe the go-to-market channel there is, is not necessarily a typical Arista customer who's looking for EOS and cloud vision, but a technology partner like Dell Technologies or Nutanix that wants to integrate this with their servers and storage. So very much like Sonic or FBOSS, this is, this is a converged infrastructure solution. So is it right to think about um, that serving a part of the market that you probably never would have served and therefore you can reconcile it with the overall strategy? 
Uh, that's correct. Um, you know, again, it's early days and we're still learning. And, uh, you know, both Doug Murray and Kyle, the co-founder, are teaching us as we speak. But if we look at their over 300 customers, the, the overlap with our customers is only one-third. So 60%, um, 65% of the customers are new to us. Great. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Your next question comes from Brian. You know, Deutsche Bank, your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking the question. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the 400, your 400 gig opportunity. Uh, can you talk about uh, expected market share for, for 400 gigs, maybe just at a high level, uh, especially versus your peers? I think it's fair to say that, you know, you were dominant in 100 gig at hyperscale clouds, but is the expectation to, to win the majority of 400 gig deals or uh, are you taking a more conservative view where, um, you know, your peers might see sizable wins as well? Thank you. Well, you know, I think our peers should have seen sizable wins on 100 gig too. I don't know why they missed the boat. But it's very unnatural for uh, an incumbent to lose a speed transition. So the fact that Arista became number one is just never been done in the networking industry before. Now, what we see with 400 gig overall timeline is we, we have been consistent on that. We are seeing early trials. We expect mainstream de deployments this year, particularly in the second half. And obviously, the cloud will play a big role, but it will also be some of the high-end en enterprises and service providers as well. And so given the trials we're seeing, uh, we, we don't expect material revenue of 400 gig until the second half of this year, and really 2021. And the other thing I would point out is nobody just builds 400 gig in isolation. It always happens in conjunction, and they're always mixing and matching 100 gig and uh, 400 gig. So, I, I, Ashwin, you want to add to that? So, uh, just we two comments here. Uh, Brian, uh, I know everyone's focused on 400 gig. I do want to remind you and everyone else, 100 gig is actually growing in 2020. It's not being replaced just yet. <laughs> and there are many other iterations coming soon as well, whether it's uh, 8 by 50 going to 4 by 100 or 8 by 100 as well. So it's not just a single transition that our customers are planning or working with us on. There are multiple three to three year generational roadmap items being discussed. Lastly, um, there is some dependency on the DCI or backbone networks on availability of VR optics at scale. And that's still expected to be uh, second half, maybe even end of the year, uh, and hence any material deployments in that space will be in 2021. And Ashwin, just to reiterate your point, the TAM for 100 gig is 4.5 billion. I don't know the TAM for 400 gig will even hit a few hundred million this yes, year. Pilot is not a TAM. Yeah, pilot is not a TAM. <laughs> it's a pilot. Okay, good one-liner. Thanks, Brad. You're your next question comes from Itai Kedron with Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Hi, Itai. Yes, hi, ladies. Um, two questions for me. I know Curtis tries to limit me to one, but I'll try to sneak one in. Um, I'm not Itai. Uh, yes, uh, regarding uh, the acquisition of Big Switch, I do want to understand the relationship with Dale and also if there's a uh, revenue concentration for Big Switch. Uh, if I remember correctly, Microsoft is a big customer for them, so if we could discuss that. And then on Dale, they also have other uh, companies they work with in this space, uh, Cumulus, if I remember correctly. Uh, help me understand uh, how do you think the nature of that relationship is going to look like uh, going forward? Oh, that's a good question. First of all, we didn't see any significant revenue concentration, and certainly not Microsoft. That could have been a past statistic, but not true now. So there's there's obviously some big customers, and they have some top ten, but not specifically one that uh, is a 10% co or concentration. Um, so coming back to your question on how do we see this, so we do see the partnership with Dell getting stronger. Um, how Big Switch was selling was really software only, disaggregated uh, from hardware, and a lot of the hardware was Dell switches. We continue to plan to offer that model and strengthen our partnership with Dell and um, make that stronger. So we are not changing the sales motion, and it complements what Arista is doing in the, you know, in the high-end enterprise and Cloud Titans very, very well. So no change. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. Your next question comes from Emmett Dariani with Evercore. Your line is open. Hi, this is Irvin dialing in for Amit. You know, I also had a question about your campus switching business. It continues to do very well for you, but can you perhaps help us understand 
what the margin profile for this business looks like um, versus your broader portfolio. Oh, okay. Um, I would generally say the margin is about the same, but if you say versus our router portfolio as opposed to versus the our broader portfolio. portfolio. Sorry, not, not, not okay, broader. Okay, the broader. Okay. okay. Broader. Yeah. yeah. About the same. Uh, more, more pricing pressure in the campus always because it, it, the market is defined that way, but the margins sound significantly different. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Irvin. Your next question comes from Ben Bolin with Cleveland Research. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, I wanted to go back to 400 gig. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you think the, the builds for 400 gig differ from what you saw in 100. And specifically, I'm interested in any thoughts you have on how your partners approach their own OS development efforts, uh, any switch standardization efforts, uh, just any high-level thoughts there. And then, how do you think the margin opportunity for 400, how does that compare to what you saw with 100? Sure. Uh, ben, in terms of the 400 gig architecture and how our uh, largest customers are leading the way there, uh, the entire architecture needs to contemplate a server flow, let's say at 100 gig, being able to go through the network. So you have to upgrade it end to end. You cannot just upgrade in silos and be done with it. So for Large-scale architectures, upgrading the backbone and the DCI networks is almost a step, necessary step one before you can do 400 gig in the broader leaf spine design. And that depends on VR, other optics, and so on, And but that's where the testing is going on already in, in the lab trials that we are involved in today. For AI, which are closed clusters, 400 gig is already starting to see a little bit of deployment, but these are still very small scales. Um, simply a 32 by 400 gig type of design in a mini leaf spine. And uh, there we are working with our customers very well with code development. Uh, it may not be just the OS. That problem I think we've already addressed with our best customers and partners. But it's actually code development with the NIC and the FPGA and the GPU and so on. That is also happening already. Great. Your next question comes from Sammy Badry with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. I had a question for you regarding Big Switch and just the operating margin drag that Big Switch, the Big Switch acquisition is going to create in 2020. And maybe I was hoping some, for some specifics on 2021 accretion that you mentioned. Is this a 1Q2Q 2021 accretion or is this a back half of 2021 accretion that you are anticipating? I'll answer the second question, and then, Ida, if you could, I wouldn't call it too much of a drag, but maybe. Um, but uh, in terms of when it will be accretive, uh, you know, the, the, the forecast we have challenged the team with is to be accretive by the end of 2021. Obviously, I'd like to see it sooner. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, once we get out of Q1, Q1 was always going to be a quarter that was, um, you know, tight from an operating margin perspective just because of the, where the revenue came in at and the mix of business that we have with cloud being heavier. Um, so you are seeing a lower kind of, um, you know, operating margin in Q1. I think once, once we get out of Q1, you know, we had talked on the last call about a 35% operating margin uh, being kind of the target, and I think, you know, we can absorb the switch uh, within that, right, um, as we move through the year. And then, uh, you know, we'll have more to say kind of on the top line on the next call once we sort out some of the purchase accounting and other stuff that we need to work through. Got it. And just actually a clarification is the $100 million run rate for campus. Um, does that include any big switch contribution, or is that just the, the stuff X big switch? No. Um, big switch was not there in December 2019, right? So I was talking about Q3 and Q4. We're well on our way to $100 million. And I just want to clarify, it's not run rate. It's revenue. Yep. So it's it. real revenue. Thanks, Jimmy. Your next question comes from Tejas Venkantesh from UBS. Your line is open. Thank you. It looks like Microsoft was only down 5% in 2019, a bit better than what you were expecting. Given that in the past you provided early color on what Microsoft could be as a percentage of revenue, I was hoping, Jeffrey, you could do that for 2020. <laughs> and then uh, and then secondly, I'd be a fool. Nice try, <laughs> nice try Tejas, but I'd be a fool to do that right now. Wouldn't you say after the surprises we had last year? <laughs> I'm teasing you. Well, this one Go went ahead. better. 
but um, but the, the second thing I wanted to ask about was: Is Tier Two Cloud now less than 10% of revenue, and is the visibility sort of improving, given that it was such a such a drag in 2019? Thank you. So that, that's a good question, Tejas. None of our five verticals that I report are less than 10% revenue. Right. Your next question comes from Aaron Rakers with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Thanks for uh, taking the question. I, I kind of want to build on that last kind of question. As, as you look forward, I think I think last quarter you alluded to that one of your large cloud titan customers were actually just flat out pausing uh, with regard to their spending dynamic as it relates to maybe a server uh, cycle uh, a, a variable kind of consideration. You know, as you as you think about your outlook today. How would you characterize if whether or not that's changed at all? Has a slowdown become more pervasive across your Cloud Titan customers? Just any kind of update on how you kind of roll up that Cloud Titan forecast, you know, this year relative to what you thought coming out of last quarter? Yeah, that's a good question, Aaron. So, first of all, just to um, reiterate, uh, all the surprises we received from that specific Cloud Titan remain and are being factored into the 2020 forecast. Um, so, those numbers will be lower this year, right? As for the other Cloud Titans, each one's unique, so it's not necessarily feeding into the others. So that is specific to that one. And each one has their architecture, their timelines, their migrations, their, their specific CapEx plans. So I wouldn't roll one into the other. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Your next okay. question comes from Paul Silverstein with Cohen. Your line is open. Right. Jay Street, I've got a similar question, but from a different angle with respect to cloud. So we went back several quarters ago. You spoke about that traumatic pause. And yeah, I think you also mentioned the fact that it wasn't just a question of when they would return, but to what magnitude when they did. So the question I now have for you is, I assume by definition your visibility for Microsoft and Facebook is not what it was at its peak. Far from it. But what visibility, how would you characterize that visibility today looking downstream, not just the next quarter or two, but further out? Do you have any visibility as to what those customers will look like a year from now? And it's not speaking about a quarterly period, but obviously speaking from, a, from an annual standpoint, what the contributions will be. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, so uh, if you go back consistently to our last three years, I think we've always said we we don't have more than a one to two quarter visibility on any of our cloud titans, and that hasn't changed. So I wouldn't be able to give you annual visibility of what they spend this year versus next year would be. I do think we get greater visibility in the second half of this year on how their next year will look like, but uh, in terms of broad trends. But uh, that answer hasn't changed despite the pause and puts and takes. All right. If I can ask you guys, uh, we don't have visibility into their surprises. <laughs> no, fair enough. Okay, guys, on the enterprise, just very quickly, uh, Jay you kept referencing the million-dollar-plus deals. You said it's almost doubled over the past three years. Can you tell us how many million-dollar deals you have in enterprise? Hundreds. Many hundreds. Right. Well, no, it All can't right. be many hundreds because you'd, go, you'd be well beyond your $100 million target. I'm talking about campus specifically. Oh, oh, you're only talking about campus. Oh, I see. I don't have that answer, but I was talking about overall enterprise, including campus. Great. Okay. But right. you don't have the campus. Your, your next question comes from Jeff Quill with Numara Instanet. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, we have been hearing from some of the uh, uh, larger OEMs that the server chipset availability is a little tighter than they might have hoped. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that there would be an implication for Arista a year ago, but but given so the, the the tenor of the conversation we had last quarter, uh, I'm wondering if that is something that we should be monitoring just in case some of your other web scale customers can't get all the servers they want, or some of the tier two players can't get the servers they want. Uh, and that may uh, then uh, impinge upon your 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 switch sales to them. No, so, um, just it doesn't really impact us uh, as much on a short term uh, variation over there. Uh, especially the cloud companies, they decouple supply chain planning for these uh, issues and have one or two months of gaps anyway. 
if it's a fluctuation of one or two months, it doesn't really impact us. Okay, thanks, Anshul. And then uh, as a clarification, I think in the past you've talked about uh, the likelihood of coming back to year-over-year -year revenue growth in the fourth quarter of 2020. Is that still sort of a, a, a reasonable place for us to, to stick a yard mark? Yeah, Jeff, that's our hope. Okay. We hope for Thank that. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Us too. Your <laughs> next question comes from Alex Kurtz with KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is open. Thanks. Uh, I just want to clarify uh, the comment about the sluggishness for cloud cloud service provider and service provider. That, that sluggish comment, Jay Shree, you needed that, that was for both yeah. both verticals. Yes. Yeah, combined. Yeah. Okay. Combined. Okay. Yeah. Combined. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jay Shree, last quarter, you know, you, you outlined changes in how you thought the the cloud service provider segment was, you know, considering on prem versus uh, on prem infrastructure spend and maybe some of them moving back to cloud. Can you just give us an update on how you see that vertical? I mean, I know you, you outlined it here in, in the growth projection, but that was, that was a change from prior view. So I was just wondering if there's any update on that segment specifically. Uh, nothing's changed significantly, um, although um, some of the tier two cloud providers have resumed some small spends and some of them are still evaluating. So. All right. Okay, so no longer a, a you know you don't see it as a as a near term you know secular opportunity right now from from what you can see. No, not in the first half. No, I think there's less of not a drag. I mean, not a drag, but not an amazing upside either. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Alex. Your ne your next question comes from Taliani with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey guys, I have two questions. First. Um, if I remove Facebook, which I have, sorry, um, uh, Amazon, sorry, Microsoft, which I have perfect numbers. <laughs> which one? I'm confused. And, <laughs> eventually, I'm going to, eventually, I'm going to get to the right answer, yeah. So if I remove Microsoft, which I have perfect numbers for both years, and then I assume um, Facebook at 9% last year because that's the highest number below 10% uh, versus what this year, the growth is only 6%. If I assume for Facebook 5%, which again, it wasn't a 10% customer, so it has to be below that. So if I assume any, anything below, the growth is even lower than 6%. So the question is, why aren't you growing faster with everyone else? Forget Facebook and, and Microsoft. Why don't we see faster growth like we used to do? Because we've always, always been doing this exercise without Microsoft, and the growth was always very strong. And the second question, not related. Oh, hold on. Why is hold, hold, on. Hold, on. hold on. Hold on. We're still processing your first question. Might be. Well, because we, okay. we're still trying okay. to understand how you computed this. Did you compute deferred revenue in your question? No, I did I not. Mean, part of, I just part of okay. the issue. Um, right. Yeah, part okay. Part of the issue going from 2019 to 2020 is that you, know, you had this deferred revenue, 118 million, which is like 5% of revenue, effectively, right? Close. Right, that um, you have to backfill effectively in 20. Right, so that kind of that's a drag on the on the growth rate before you start. Right, so you have to adjust for that. Um, but even with that, what we're is saying it, is that that cloud vertical will be will be kind of flat to down from a demand perspective. Right. Yeah. But the deferred, what? by the way, is the deferred related to Microsoft or Facebook, or the deferred related to everyone else? If you trace back in time, it was uh, non-Microsoft, and obviously it's a large number. So I, I think you can you can figure out that it is a it's a Facebook uh, impact, right? And we talked about that as a you know 16 for 16.6 percent with the deferred, probably 12 percent of revenue without the deferred, right? Okay. Your next question comes from Simon oh. Leopold. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Sorry, fine. I had it. Well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to you if we have time. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Your next question. Oh. Your next question comes from Simon Leopold with Raymond James. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Uh, I got confused not only from Tal's question there. Anyway, um, <laughs> wanted to, to to ask you about the the commentary several of the the uh, hyperscale providers made about extending the useful useful lives of their servers. Wondering how, how that translates into your business for intra data center uh, switching, and, and if this was uh, an aspect that you were aware of 
when you had provided your forecast uh, last quarter or, or whether the commentary we heard during this earnings season was, was also new to you. Thank you. No, uh, Simon, when we uh, did our earnings call last quarter, we very much stated what we had seen from at least one of the cloud titans where they were delaying the refresh. And now you've seen in the market that some of the other cloud customers are doing this as well. Uh, but we're not seeing this with the other Arista customers uh, so far, even in the cloud space. So for us, it's limited to one customer. We don't deal with the other uh, large cloud company you're referring to as much, so we're not as exposed there. But it's not a market-wide trend. It's very specific to their architecture, the next generation they're on, and the sort of type of offloads they're looking for to decide which CPU generation they select. And is there a way or some math to, to figure out how to translate if, say, they extend the life by one year, so instead of three-year replacement, they go to four-year? Is there some arithmetic or rule of thumb to help us think about how to quantify the impact for you? Uh, we don't have it. I'm quite sure someone on this call has a model around that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, that's not something we try to focus. Okay. Mostly a delay of a year yeah. in the spend. All right. Thank, Thank you for taking the question. Thank you, your, Simon. Your next question comes from Jim Suva with City Investment Research. Your line is open. Thanks, everyone. Um, I sincerely just have one question because I'm just a very simple guy and not as smart as others. But uh, whether it be Jay Shree or Ida or Curtis, um, a, a quarter or two ago you had talked about, you know, a Clyde Cloud Titan skipping a refresh cycle or elongating their purchasing. You know, some of the commentary after that was, well, maybe they're using white box or maybe they found a better compute standard or a way to fit more through compression or duplexing or some other standard. Now that we've had several months behind us, can you give us any visibility of, do you feel more confident that it truly is just a delay? Or are they looking at other solutions? Or just kind of revisit that topic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Jim, um, I think all the theories of those answers are not true. Uh, I think the customer's been pretty straightforward with us that uh, they have always been using Arista as well as some internal development, and we've been working with them on the internal development. So we, we feel very comfortable that their forecast just changed, and they continue to be an important partner with us. Okay. Thank you so much. It's appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Your next question comes from Samik Chatterjee with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Uh, hi, th thanks for taking that question. I just wanted to kind of, um, given kind of your commentary on the slower spending you're seeing from your customers, uh, you obviously have a Q1 seasonality that's weaker than what we've seen historically. As we look through the rest of the year, um, is it kind of fair to assume, given the visibility you have right now, that the seasonality uh, through the remainder of the year will be weaker than what we saw in kind of normal years like 2018, for example, and are you still kind of comfortable reiterating the full year, I think, guide that you gave last time, which was for a modest decline in revenues? Okay, so, uh, uh, Samit, I'm a little c confused by your question. Uh, we did not give – are you talking about cloud customers or customers at large? Uh, What's your cloud question? Customers. Cloud customers. Cloud customers. Okay, okay. For now that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, look um, – we we feel the same way as we did last time, which is um, we we had a lot of uh, weakness in the spending, and it's reflected in our Q1. Uh, I think we will know better about the rest of the year when we get to the second half more. But as it stands, nothing's changed. Um, the, the 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 capex that they will spend, uh, Arista feels in a very strong position to compete, differentiate, and get the business. So we're not losing market share; we're winning the sockets. But the, the rate of spend and adoption, we do believe, will be a flat to down year this year. Thank you. Your, your next question comes from James Fish with Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Hey, hey team. Uh, uh, happy almost Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> hey, Jeff. Can you, guys go, can you guys go over the linearity of the mix of customers over the course of the year and if it was back half loaded at all? And I uh, just want to be clear, is Cloud Titan going to be flat to, flat to down double digits on top of the $118 million deferred headwind, or is the flat to do, down double digits 
inclusive of the headwind. Right. So, so the the meaningful revenue decline and the the double digit are all referencing revenue, right? So saying basically the revenue numbers uh, will decline meaningfully, right? That includes 118 million, right? When we talked about demand and we said, you know, that we expect it to be flat to down, that's not referencing that double digit number, right? That's a that, that's a commentary that obviously will play out if you see where it goes, but it's a it's not trying to say that it's a double digit number. Uh, and then to answer your question on Q4 linearity, I'm just looking at the chart Mark Foss is giving me. It was pretty linear across the three months. We had a record million dollars of customers in Q4 and um, good spend across our top 50 customers. So nothing unusual except more campus. Your next question comes from Tim Long with Barclays. Your line is open. Hi, Tim. Tim, are you there? Tim? Let's go to the next one. Hey, Tim, call back. Your next question comes from Ryan Koontz with Rosenblatt Securities. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for the question. I was wondering if you could uh, speak to your outlook for international. Obviously, hyperscale has been a big piece of that, shipping to their international destinations, but you could speak to kind of any updates in the strategy or uh, channel uh, development there that's going to supercharge that business for you? Thanks. Um, uh, Anshul and the team have invested pretty significantly in international, especially, of course, the developed countries in Europe and Asia-Pac. Uh, we had a strong um, quarter, uh, and um, we're starting to see some important customer wins in the enterprise and even some small service providers. Um, we um, obviously are much more channel-led in and international, that's always been the case. So that's been a strong area of experience for us. And I, I actually want to add to that. I think that's a strong uh, area of growth uh, for us. Actually, both in uh, headcount growth, uh, we actually have uh, a significant number of heads added to international. And on the channel side, the channel development plan we have um, is a, there's a separate one for US, but there's a separate one for AMEA and APAC as well with a different ecosystem, different set of partners, and so on, and that's coming along reasonably well. As I just mentioned, the international locations are mostly fulfilled by channel, but now we're working with them to make it channel-led as well. So um, if you remove cloud and so on, the rest of the organic international business is doing well. And one other, just one quick add to what Anshu said, generally our customer logos are higher internationally than in the U.S., um, lower purchase uh, of sale. But uh, out of the 6,300 cumulative customers, half come international. Your next, oh, well, thank you. oh, your next question comes from Tim Long with Barclays. Your line is open. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, just wanted to hey, ask. Um, hi, how you doing? I uh, just wanted to ask um, kind of two related questions. First. Um, could you talk a little bit, there's been a lot of chatter um, about silicon diversification uh, in the switching area. So could you give us your views, obviously, with a big customer um, making an announcement and starting to talk about some, some traction there. So w what do you think the impact is there? And related, what, do you, what are you seeing uh, just overall on white box uh, these days? Are you seeing any, any change to who's using it or, or how they're using it? Thank you. Uh, okay, well, uh as you know, uh, Arista has always been a big proponent of merchant silicon, and you know ASICs, uh, notwithstanding this new announcement, have been around 30 years. It's not ASICs are, by themselves are not new. Uh, we do see three dimensions. First of all, is from a best of breed silicon standpoint, we couldn't be more pleased with our the silicon we received from Broadcom, both on the Trident Tomahawk side and Jericho. We have very high confidence. It's a case where you can't just build one-point product. You have to have a full roadmap, and we've always been ahead of vendor-specific ASICs, and we believe that will continue. Um, in terms of software, you know, silicon by itself um, is not so interesting if you can't build a system. So obviously EOS, um, we feel, is the most competitive software differentiated across many merchant silicon devices. I think it's, we've supported it over 18 uh, fam silicon families, maybe more than that. And so, in general, we feel like uh, that leaves only one other thing, which is Cisco selling chips. And obviously, uh, that's not our business. They're going to be competing with Intel and Broadcom on that one. 
Your last Thank question you. comes from Taliani with Bank of America. Your line is open. Tim, you've got the last much. question. Um, <laughs> by, the, by the way, I just want to comment something. We'll take it offline, but uh, we shouldn't remove the deferred, and I can explain it later why. The, the, the number is the number. You could remove both sides. But in any case, I wanted to ask about the gross margin. Why is it declining sequentially next quarter? I don't think anyone asked this question. No, they didn't. Our customer, our customer mix, right? We were heavy uh, enterprise and uh, financials in Q4, and we'll be, we're heavier cloud mix in Q1. Q1 always has a, a heavier cloud mix because enterprise just takes time to, to ramp in the first quarter. Got it. Thank you. Great. All right. Okay. Well, this concludes the Arista Q4 2019 earnings call. Thank you for joining us today. Please note that moving forward, our earnings calls will move to Tuesdays, starting with the Q1 2020 call, which will take place on Tuesday, May 5th. Lastly, we have posted a presentation which provides additional information on our fiscal results, which you can access on our investor section of our website. Thank you for joining, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's call. You may now disconnect.